Welcome to this Sunday's virtual class from the Bigham Young University Family History Library at Provo, Utah. Today's class is uh, entitled Highlights of the Roots Tech 2023 Virtual and In-Person Conference. Our presenter is James Tanner. We appreciate his preparation and willingness to share his knowledge on this subject. We'll now turn the time over to James. My wife and I attended Roots Tech and from the day on Wednesday afternoon when we arrived until Saturday afternoon when we when they shut everything down and we had to leave. I don't think either one of us stopped talking or stopped moving or stopped being a, being involved with everything that was going on for enough time to do other than eat. And that's it was about it. On Saturday, we didn't even get a chance to eat because we just never stopped. So we're pretty well wiped out. It's a good thing this uh, class is about a week after after Roots Tech, because I don't think we either of us could have done anything during the first part of this last week. Anyway, uh, it's very intense. I would very, very much encourage anybody who has uh, an interest in genealogy, even at a very low level, even if you're just sort of interested in it, I think that uh, it can be an almost life-changing experience for someone who has been doing research if they've been doing it for quite some time. If you've been working at home or you've been working at a local family history or family search center or some other thing like this all the time you've been doing genealogy, to go to the Roots Tech is amazing because you see thousands of people who are interested in exactly the same thing you are, which is usually not very common, even in your own family. So this is a, a, an amazing experience. So let's kind of get into it. And doing this kind of a presentation, it's kind of the real challenge is separating the wheat from the chaff. In other words, the things that I think are, are exceptionally uh, important and uh, those things which we can watch on the on-demand on on uh, videos and, and see otherwise. So you're not going to get a lot of information here about the keynotes or any of those kinds of things because there's really not a lot of genealogical information that is presented. However, it is a phenomenal experience. This is the website. This is the, if you now, this is the exit website. You can watch to get an idea of the conference. You can watch this Roost Tech Thank You video. It's very interesting. You can see my wife and I uh, and a lot of our friends in the video. And you can also get a feeling for what it was like to be there with all the people. If you go up to the top of the screen, you'll see a, a, a little menu bar that says On Demand. And those are where all the videos are. So there's where you can go look and find all of this information that, that's here on the website. And there are 4,301 videos, presentations. So uh, they're in various languages. They're in all sorts of subjects. There are filters. Uh, you can search for, uh, for the content in, a, in a, a lot of different ways. If you have a specific person you're looking for, then you can click on the speaker and, uh, and select a person from a long drop-down list of all the speakers at RootsTech. There's also a, an option to view all of the videos, and that's where you get not just the ones from 2023, but from previous years. So this is a cumulative catalog of a tremendous number of genealogy videos. I mean, it's very obvious that one hour can't do justice to the, the tremendous amount of information and, and all of the things that went on at the RootsTech conference. And I think it's important that I, you know, when I did that, it was important that I decided to highlight those innovations and challenge changes that will have the most impact on how we do genealogy. Uh, some of the things have, let's say, matured over the last few years that were kind of innovative ideas and now are basic staples of what's going on in the larger genealogical community or, across the world. So. They're very important things because they're going to change some basic things that you do and the way that you do things with genealogy over the next uh, months, years, uh, in an in a ever more rapid pace than they have in the past. 
And I already know of more developments that are going to affect the genealogy that are occurring outside of what we call the genealogical community, but things that are happening just with, with things on search engines and, and the new things that we're going to be talking about. The number one thing that is out there and is that you would focus on if you were if you're listening to what's happening in the greater world of development as well as with genealogy is the use of artificial intelligence. Now there's a, a definition of our artificial intelligence here, and it basically says that programming computer systems to do things that you would normally think that were accomplished by humans, things that we do kind of routinely when we evaluate and do research in genealogy are being added to the abilities of a very complex and very uh, trained computer system. And some of those things like visual perceptions, like handwriting recognition, speech recognition, uh, making decisions as to whether something is or is not consistent, correct, let's say, and translating between languages is all being involved in, in various types of, of artificial intelligence. I think the term artificial intelligence is uh, was a poor poor selection. Unfortunately, it, it caught the kind of the media's attention when it was coined. So I don't really think that it it it's not really artificial intelligence. What it is is it's computer aided human intelligence. So let me give you kind of an example that makes it simple. When you go online and do a search on Google, for example, uh, or any of the other search engines out there, whichever one you happen to use, you're basically using artificial intelligence. You're, you're using a, a computer program that when you type in a certain question or type in a certain uh, a term that you're looking for, goes out and compares that term to a vast library of indexed material and then pulls together the things that it presumes by another set of instructions that you're looking for. And you go back and forth making searches and you'll begin to be able to see that it becomes more and more accurate. That's kind of the whole thing that happens here. When you look at the, the current end product, for instance, the the things that are going on with a, a program called chat, GPT, or whatever. Those kinds of programs are, are simply very advanced search engines. They're programs that have a lot of extra things added on with little uh, other kinds of routines. So that's why it's important. So one of the main things at, at Roots Tech was AI-assisted storytelling. So when you, there were at least three major people that were involved in that. Number one was a company called Storied, uh, a brand new company. Uh, we really haven't seen much of what they can do yet, but one of the things that they are able to do is uh, assist people to write histories from using artificial intelligence. Another one was the Deep Storied. Uh, this isn't exact, uh, one was, that was primarily developed for Roots Tech or announcement of Roots Tech. It's been around. It's from my heritage, and basically it allows artificial intelligence to animate a photograph and then add an audio story to it, which you then can create as part of the process. So you can have your ancestor tell their own story about themselves. Another one is story making, story maker Studio. This is another one that's similar kind of thing in, in assisting you in in creating stories about your ancestors. And these are all done and uh, driven by artificial intelligence. From the family search standpoint at Roots Tech, the big issue and the biggest thing that came out is uh, has been hidden away sort of in the inside of the family search website. If you've used the search tab on family search, you know that there's a, a selection on the search tab that's records, images, family tree, and there's one called genealogies. And you may have looked at that and then not really understood or, or knew what was in the genealogies section. And, and uh, it's 
going and exploring this particular section of family search which contains millions and millions and millions of records by the way is a little bit beyond this particular presentation but it'd be really important for you at this point to become familiar with uh, the various different things that are here and the one that was focused on at roots tech was one that's being developed and has uh, basically now is introdu being introduced into uh, the family search program one of the things that they mentioned was that they were going to make the genealogy searchable what that means is that family search when you do a search for an individual or when you do a search for anything else on the website you'll find that these things are are now being are going to be included you'll be able to say search oral histories search computer generated trees the reason being that this that these are being indexed in the sense of searched and made available and one thing that's that family search was moving towards is what's called all word searches meaning instead of doing the indexing in the uh, traditional way that we've done it the last few years and that is uh, being given a set of fields like first names last middle name last name uh, place of birth date place of birth all those kinds of fields all all word searching searches every word in the document and puts it in an index so you can do it like currently is available for a lot of digitized books that you can search for every word in the book and that includes names and that includes all the dates and information that you would normally look for from a genealogical standpoint and when that happens is that that transition happens on family search and coupled with handwriting recognition which I'll talk about in just a few minutes and some other developments in searching which are also AI or artificial intelligence generated most of this information is going to change dramatically so family search computer generated trees I'm sure some researchers if they even hear that they'll go oh no not another one it's going to really mess stuff up no this is not something that would uh, is going to mess anybody up because what this does is it's a collection of family trees created by the computer the computer interprets historical records to construct a tree for a particular location and time period but it also does so in a way that emulates what a, a genealogical researcher does for example as they were introducing this they they referenced the research uh, research standards that have been established in the genealogical community and all of the other expert levels of, of uh, consideration that are given to records uh, cluster research and and all of the uh, more technical aspects of the of genealogy and they're implementing these into this huge system of artificial intelligence which will then try to use the same criteria for connecting people so for example here is a list this is the list of the preliminary list of the computer generated trees from the collection that's there now there's a half a dozen there's about a dozen half a dozen of them and for an example I did this particular one is the Alberto Casas Garza in Nuevo León in Mexico and so the question I looked up uh, to see uh, records if this person was in records and so I did a search for him so this is the search and we want this person to, and down below which isn't visible on this slide it, it, you can determine this collection in this collection you're going to be looking at the computer generated trees so doing that research it uh, the computer you can now see that this has came from computer generated trees found him with his full name his birth and also was able to find with the records that were available his parents and three of his grandparents his his maternal line the grandparents and and one from his paternal line all of these records are completely sourced in other words you can click on the, the right here where it is and look at the original records on each of these people to see where all this information came from so if you want to verify that the tree found the right people 
but it just basically did the search for all these people and uh, with the records associated with their own records that were associated with them and it gave you all the sources for it so instead of doing the the, the initial research of trying to find additional family names by doing additional searches and and looking through the records uh, page by page family search through because this whole record set now is has been identified by handwriting recognition we have this much information and this is a short one I chose one of the short ones uh, there was a list some of them had as many as 1500 new names that they had extracted in a sense from the records with all of the documentation and sources for all those names and if you wanted to check it you can you know you're it's I would suggest that you probably do need to review and and check the documents but as they're cited uh, but this immediately adds two more generations to the family tree and what happens when they do the same thing on each of the people who are named there it's very possible that additional searches through the through the uh, collections and these things rather than taking days or hours take a matter of each one takes a matter of a few seconds to correct so the computer can go through and and make all these connections and create all these trees uh, literally as fast as we could talk about it so this is kind of a, this is a kind of a game changer because as this happens uh, there's going to be oh you're creating a duplicate so da, da, da. well the problem we're going to run into obviously is that as this happens there's going to be more more artificial intelligence applied to the issue of duplicates to the issue of same name same person kinds of things so this is this to understand that this is actually working is uh, kind of saying like saying well I don't trust the search engines like I don't trust Google searches I I don't you know if it comes up I don't even know if that's correct or not well obviously uh, if you're going to incorporate this in your part of the family tree you're still going to do that evaluation process but this is basically uh, moving ahead through a, a fairly dramatic step that will <clears throat> help you get past and and spend your time a little bit more productively rather than than looking page by page through uh, 2000 documents as I have done recently okay so one of the things that's also involved in hand uh, in artificial intelligence is handwriting recognition now this is something that's been going on um, for years and years the U.S. post the post office has been using handwriting recognition for a long time and and other people have done it the problem of course is that uh, we're not trying to do uh, with family search we're not we're not trying to do just handwriting recognition in the sense of getting an address we were trying to read this entire text uh, now if you think that this is difficult for a computer it, you can imagine you all you have to do is look at th what I the example I have here and uh, understand that it's difficult for people and at one point I'll uh, over the period of time a lot of this was the uh, uh, background of this was done by the B BYU family history technology lab at uh, Brigham Young University but uh, around the world there have been people uh, actually in competition with each other uh, they have international competitions as to accuracy back and forth it's kind of a, a the thing that the programmers get involved in and what they have done in the last couple of years is make some tremendous breakthroughs in uh, being able to recognize these documents and uh, read the handwriting at a level that is superior to even experienced indexers okay understand what I just said is that this is now at a higher level of recognition on the on the texts that have been examined than you would find yourself if you were doing it and there's a couple of examples of how this happened the first example was one that just happened this past year and uh, 
was very much talked about by Ancestry at the Roots Tech Conference, and that is the 1940 U.S. Census in 2012 took over nine months to to uh, transcribe, index, and uh, and get up online for searching. The 1950 U.S. Census in 2022, just 10 years later, took nine days. Literally, literally, the computers ran through the entire 1950 census, which was much larger, by the way, than the 1940 census, and did the index, the whole index for the entire census in nine days. Now, what happened after that was that the people who uh, basically they contracted with uh, Family Search and Family Search asked for volunteers, and the volunteers went through and reviewed the indexing that had been done. I helped with that very small amount of time, uh, among all the other things that I do, mainly to see about what I felt about the accuracy. And I was finding it to be tremendously accurate, at least as accurate as as uh, as individual individual people's uh, indexing efforts. And there were corrections that were that needed to be made were things that uh, would be very difficult for anybody to do. I mean, scribbles and things that didn't make any sense or in entries where they'd written in other words that besides names and things like that. But as over the time, as it was being developed and as the re as the review process was going on, they continued to write uh, more uh, code and were able to make the the review process even simpler as they identified some common errors that were made by the census people all through the records that they hadn't uh, identified earlier. So what's the what, what's going to happen here? Well, the, the, the most the simplest things you're going to find is if you go on to the indexing program today uh, on Family Search that many 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 people hundreds of thousands of people have been involved in for quite some time. And they're doing this, and I know people who spend a considerable lot of time as, as involved in doing indexing. Well, you go to indexing on any given day, and you may come up with this. I'm searching all languages, all levels, and I'm getting no projects. And the reason for that is that all of this can be done now done by uh, handwriting recognition and the artificial intelligence programs that are putting all that together. And it's it's not a matter of a few thousand names. It's matters of millions of names every week, millions upon millions of names every week. So they're working through massive amounts of information. It's not something that's going to be resolved. In other words, all the documents aren't going to be transferred into uh, by artificial intelligence and handwriting recognition. But it's going to make the, the review process move up a level. So now, instead of doing the actual indexing, you'll be reviewing the indexing that's been done by, by the computer. And by and large, uh, if, if pre previous experience on my part is anything, you'll find that it's, it's uh, very accurate. And that a lot of times, you'll just be clicking and clicking and saying, correct, 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 correct. And uh, that's all it takes. Okay, so this is going to, why is this going to make a difference? Well, the difference is that uh, what you're going to find is that, uh, first of all, you're going to be getting involved at a different level. That's the review of the handwritten documents replaces the indexing. So there won't be any initial indexing. It will all be done by computers. But then you'll uh, be able to uh, work through this much faster. And... Uh, the effect of that is that there's going to be massive, more massively more documents available on Family Search that have been indexed than in previous previously. So one of the things that when we compare uh, the large database programs, the genealogical programs with each other, we have programs like Ancestry and MyHeritage where all of the records have been indexed, and then we have Family Search where only a percentage of the records have been indexed. And now family search is in the process of making that getting more on parity because as this handwriting recognition and program goes, 
uh, the number of records rather than just a few thousand or a few hundreds of thousands of names a month will be turning into millions of names a week. And so that's uh, the important thing. Of course, the review process is still going to be slower than the computers. But as it happened with the 1950 census, what we'll be doing is having the, um, the reviewers will be working through uh, and the review process will become more accurate as the reviewers find a consistent kind of problem then the programmers can address those problems and it sort of keeps snowballing until it, it is even more accurate. So from this standpoint, uh, this is probably going to have the biggest direct impact on getting new records for genealogical research that we haven't had previously that are basically sitting out there in a big pile called images on family search. There's a couple of billion records out there that can be begin to be indexed and processed and uh, accuracy will in, to continue to increase. And there's developments out in the computer world that's making the accuracy, that making the computers even more able to recognize and see consistencies and duplicates and inconsistencies. So this is gonna start changing the way uh, that, uh, we, uh, that we can do research and the way that we find records. Ancestry.com uh, made their announcement and they indicated that during 2022, they had acquired 5.2 billion new historical records in one year. But in 2023, they, in, they intend to add 15 billion new historical records. Now, I don't know how they count historical records, but looking in their count card catalog with the new records in the millions of millions of records up to almost a billion records, is primarily happening in the newspapers.com website uh, instead of on Ancestry as such. You, if you're doing using Ancestry and you do not have a subscription to newspapers.com, you'll, you'll get uh, a reference that says, this is on newspapers.com if you wanna see the whole article or whatever. And so in a sense, it's also being used to get people to uh, subscribe to a new program, but but this is not something that's necessarily bad, particularly if you happen to be re doing research. It's far less expensive to subscribe to these programs than it is to travel across the country to do research, believe me. Uh, that's a very expensive proposition, especially if you have to live someplace for two or three weeks or a month while you do research in primary documents. So back to what was new in, other, in family search, um, they've added seven more languages to, their, uh, to the languages that the website works with. If you are from a place speaking any of these languages now, you can see the language in your own, uh, see the website in your own language. And during the next uh, little while, there, you'll see more. This is the search status for family search. It's there's uh, billions of records. There's two million, 12 million added. It, the largest tree is over 737,000. There's 83 million total memories and searchable memories and bill, billions of other memories. They're going to publish to more than a billion new record images in 2022 and add it to a whole bunch of different countries. And also the, the 1950 census, they will family search now who did not have all of the technology available that was had by Ancestry is basically still in the process of, of uh, putting the entire index uh, census records up on the, on the website, but that should be done uh, in the next couple of months is what they said. Uh, now, this is an interesting thing. This is uh, another thing from Family Search that they mentioned. And we understand that Family Search is a, and the Family Search family tree is a shared tree. In other words, it's one Family Search family tree. There's not individual family trees out there that, that people have. When you add your information to Family Search, it's being added to the unified 
for humanity, everybody's family tree. But what's going to happen and what's always been there is that you really can't see any of the other living people. So nobody else is who is marked as living, even if they're dead, but they're marked as living, they, they can't be seen. Well, what they're going to do is create family groups. And so you'll have being able to share living family trees. And this is later in this year. And but that what that I understand that to mean is that you can incorporate a number of people as they do uh, now in kind of the limited family groups thing they have on Family Surge into your family group. And not only will the family group be able to talk to each other on Family Surge, but the family group will be able to interact and share information back and forth and work on the tree. And I wasn't, they weren't sure how far this would go, but I'm, I'm looking forward to the fact that they may actually allow let's say everybody in a certain group like if i could work with my 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 children my seven lovely children and their spouses on the family tree and everybody was working on a project or as part of a project or their own projects and we could monitor how that was going and help and and add information it would be a tremendous help to doing this uh, cooperative kind of family search that we end up doing as a family so basically, as it was explained, the members of the family groups will be able to collaboratively add and share memories with one another as about living or deceased relatives. They'll be able to collaborate with one another, adding facts and sources for living relatives. So instead of having when it, somebody dies, as it happens now, each individual who has put that person in as a living individual, that becomes a duplicate. And so it all has to be merged and on the other, once all the people, when the people realize that they need to go in and merge all these separate individuals that have been created, that you'll all be able to focus on uh, living people. And the advantage here is if it will give the opportunity to, to say, okay, I want to put up these pictures of our family and, I'm, and I think it should be on this child's uh, memories. And then the child can go there, review the pictures and say, sure, I'll put all those up. So then they go all on there and we'll be able to all see what's on each of the families. Uh, it then becomes a way of communicating in within the family and also becomes a way of allowing more information to be added to living people, which would then be impl implied is that when a person passes on, that, that, that it becomes public and then this, this information is already there instead of having to put on, go through the work of what happens after a person dies. And that should, that should be able to capture a lot more information uh, and a lot more memories about individuals as, as time goes on. I guess most of the the really, really dramatic, other dramatic areas that are affecting genealogy is uh, the DNA developments. Now, there's a couple of ways to look at DNA. It, if, if you do a DNA test, so the question is, uh, what does that tell you? And the answer coming back is, hmm, not a whole lot that's useful from a from a genealogical standpoint. It may be useful in in a few ways occasionally because it may give you uh, interest that, for example, you may. Uh, one of the questions that's commonly asked me is someone comes and says, "Well, my family says we have some uh, Native American ancestors," and my answer is, "Well, the most of the research I've done has has basically taken some." considerable time on that subject and are helping people. And uh, I've very few people that I have helped actually show that they do have somebody that's uh, Native American in their ancestry. Well, taking a DNA test will help give you at least one more piece of information. If, in fact, the DNA comes back and says you do have um, DNA connections with uh, Native Americans, then that answers your question. Then you have to still have to do the research because you're not, they're not identified. If it comes back and says, no, that doesn't necessarily mean you do not, 
but it is one more indicator that perhaps the, the, the family tradition is not as accurate as it could be. So what are we trying to do here? Well, uh, DNA at one level is very basic. In other words, if, if a DNA test indicates that you have that you are related to this person as a parent or a first cousin or whatever, and you and that isn't who you're you're what you know as a person was related, and you find out immediately that you have a possibility that you were adopted. And uh, a little, some more research will probably uh, tell you who that person, who those people are, and uh, the stories that are coming out in the genealogical community about people finding their their uh, uh, direct line ancestors, their bloodline ancestors, their genetic ancestors are. Uh, there's just hundreds of these stories now, maybe thousands of these stories. It's it's a very common. That's at this level, but. Uh, D DNA has a more uh, has a very much more uh, direct in fact on 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 developments that that go back more generations than just parents more than just identifying who your ancestors are initially of course this can be life changing but going back in time uh, it may solve some some mysteries so one of the things that has helped uh, develop this is Ancestry DNA has been working in developing DNA analysis uh, software, again, using artificial intelligence, that will help to, more, to localize and focus in on the geographic areas, but also in the case of your parents, tell which how much, which of your DNA was inherited from your uh, from your parents, from your male parent, and which one from your female parent, from your father and your mother? So you'll be able to see how it splits out. Now, this is important because as you look at the comparisons with other people, they will tell you whether it's on your father's line or on your mother's line. So before up till now, that has been had to depended on a tremendous amount of paper research. In other words, you've got to find these people and ask questions or do the research to determine who they are. And now you'll at least know whether you're looking on your father's line or on your mother's line, but then they carry that much further. And the developments that are coming uh, quickly and, and in line with uh, with ancestry uh, and with uh, uh, my heritage, both and the two of the companies that uh, were there. I understand that there are that without having a family tree, if you if you are did a DNA test and you haven't take, build a family tree on on the program, you haven't done anything with ancestry or or my heritage, you haven't put your names in there, done your research and gotten the confirmations from the DNA matching and whatever, then you're not going to you don't get any value at all out of your DNA test. You may find out your family's from Scandinavia and the British Isles, like I did here, which is not surprising since I already knew all that information. But on the other hand, the developments that are coming will carry this a lot further. And uh, as you start to use uh, my uh, ancestry and my heritage both, and I would suggest both because they're both going to do slightly different things and give you different information from different from their own uh, different things of, of uh, their different uh, groups of, of DNA testing people who's who have their their DNA tests in their company. So, for example, uh, if you take a DNA test and no one in your family ever takes a DNA test, then you, you're not going to see much of a response. There's no one there on there. There's no one who's done a, a test with ancestry from your family lines. Then you're not going to see anything on ancestry. When you add my heritage, you're adding two very very large sets of, of individuals and increase your uh, the possibility that you will find uh, DNA matches uh, dramatically. So it's uh, there is a reason for doing this. 
And uh, as they kind of emphasized uh, at uh, Roots Tech, there's really only five companies that ha in the world now that have uh, substantial enough family trees to be of any real benefit in the genealogical community. So those are, are the ones that you would probably want to look at. Now, the next thing, this is jumping to my heritage. Now, my heritage uh, is, uh, is made, uh, taken the DNA testing to a, a new level. And they, uh, if you take a DNA test pr previously to this development of this particular, because it's called the Cinemorgan explainer. And Cinemorgans are the, the measuring of the little DNA segments that you have in your uh, when they do a DNA test. Previously, you would get something like this. You have 100% possibility that, that your match is a parent, a sibling, a first cousin, an aunt, or an uncle. Okay, well, that's a lot of people, and it really doesn't, is not very conclusive. But what over the past year, what Anna introduced here at, at uh, Roots Tech, what my heritage has done has translated all that into English into good, you know, understandable English, not this one generation removed or two, five generations or or whatever, none of that stuff anymore. They have uh, set it up so you can see exactly how you're doing it. So here's what it says. That's the chart. And in addition to that, the percentages come down that you are actually that is the percentage that you're related to that person, not the, the not a, a selection of people from different parts of your uh, from your pedigree. So when you're looking at this chart, you could see that the test above, and they would show that you had this a person is this person is twelve point two percent of your second cousin, and. This person is your parent's first cousin, and this person is your great aunt or great uncle. So it's it's turned it into you doing the relationships at a far greater percentage accuracy at the same time changing the, the back to what we would all understand as our relationship with these people. So it's not trying to figure out what all that other stuff means. Uh, having tried to work through that and explain that a, a number of times, I realized that this is this really will make things a lot easier for everybody. Now that we're talking about uh, my heritage, we'd also mention that my heritage has started its third DNA quest, which is, by the way, meaning that if you are a if you are an orphan or a foundling or an adopted person and you do not know your your ancestry, you can make an application to MyHeritage and they are putting out thousands of free DNA tests. So all you have to do is go apply and it's very possible that you will get a free DNA test to uh, see if you can find your parents. Okay, let's see what else is coming on. Oh, one more thing. This isn't necessarily the earth shattering kind of thing, but this is uh, an interesting one. And that is that my heritage has added color coding for family trees. I might mention that uh, Roots Magic, uh, the big program from uh, the desktop program has now come out with Roots Magic 9. And I would suggest that there is a significant in increase in utility of that program. I've started to review it, and it's uh, yeah, all I can say is it's pure roots magic. It's it's really an interesting program. Uh, what this does here is uh, let you assign the colors to the different branches to keep track of who everyone is when you're looking at it. This was available on the fan chart, but now is available on the pedigree view uh, for tracking through who all these people, how these people are related to you on your different lines. Uh, one thing that it did it did do for me, and I hadn't seen this kind of quite as dramatically before, is that in determining this, you'll notice down up here there's uh, some people in that uh, kind of yellow orange color, and they're also down here, and it's the same color. And it turns out that 
what this shows is that these lines are both on my maternal and my paternal line. So my parents actually are related, but they're not actually related. They're related through the fact that this Marinus Christensen was, was adopted into the Christensen family. My parents always believed that they were second cousins. And until we did some very uh, interesting DNA work with my heritage, uh, which I presented up at my heritage's uh, booth up at the Roots Tech on three different days. They've recorded those. I don't know whether we'll be able to see the recordings, but uh, I hope that they are made available because they're uh, all of them were quite interesting. But basically what's happened here is that uh, uh, we have uh, a kind of a graphic showing that these two parts of your, pe your pedigree are are duplicates, they're the same families. Another way that artificial intelligence is being used is to uh, identify people from photographs of whether people are related. And this is becoming kind of spooky, but basically you can take a picture taken of a person uh, very young and in their old age, and the artificial intelligence with very high level of accuracy is able to see, tell you that these two people are the same person or that they are related and likely brother and sister or brother and brother or whatever. And this one company has a, has a uh, copyrighted patented, patented way of doing that. And it is called Related Faces. And I would uh, suggest uh, investigating this if you have photos that you can't identify. You know it's a family photo, but you don't really know who the person is. Then this uh, this program will look at large database bases of old photos who that have been identified and uh, be able to match up and tell you whether the two people are are related. And some of the stories that were being told are related about people at Roots Tech who were able to go there and have their uh, photographs identified were pretty remarkable. It just kind of here emphasize that. The, the all of this, and it says, you'll see a link there that says, search the full library when you go to the video library. And uh, you'll be able to see all of these videos and all of this information. Now, I was explaining for questions before we got going here today that there were some things that simply were not recorded. The classes, some of the classes were not recorded and they're not going to be online. But uh, the amount that it was recorded and is uh, available for free to view online is uh, impressive. Uh, in my case, for example, I will probably redo the classes that the things that I presented at Roots Tech that are not uh, that have not been recorded, and uh, we'll put them up on the BYU Family History Library uh, YouTube channel as well as the BYU Family History Library website. So. Uh, over the time in the next uh, couple of months or so, I'm sure that we can catch up and and put all of, at least some of the things that were not recorded up on uh, the website. Okay, so this is the this is the presentation, the live presentation that I gave was on this subject. It was the Great Northward Migration of over 6 million African-Americans out of the Southern part of the United States into uh, some of the major uh, cities in the United States, as well as across the country. And uh, this is part one of the six videos that I, uh, that I, that were recorded and are available on the Roots Tech site. So that's just kind of the, the to answer the question of where they are, you go to the on-demand section and uh, do a search by either my name or the title of the presentation. Well, thanks for watching.